Right. Um, so next up, we have Jonathan Baldwin, um, who is the Managing Director of Higher Education at JISC. Uh, and Jonathan's going to talk about JISC's thoughts on where uh, we see the HE sector once the pandemic is over. Um, so, hi, Jonathan. Nice to see you. Hello. Hello, everybody. Hi. Hi. Can you hear me? Uh, yes, we can. Yes. So I just now need to share my screen, don't I? Yep. Perfect. Yes, Thank you. Uh, just, just, I'm John, John Baldwin, Managing Director for, for Higher Education at JISC. JISC is the UK's... NREN, National Research and Education Network. We supply the backbone systems, Janet, cybersecurity, resilience, connectivity, etc. But we also have a strong element of thought leadership in our work. And that's what I really want to draw on in the short uh, presentation this afternoon, Phil, colleagues. So um, in November last year, we published this report, Learning and Teaching Reimagined. It was the product of uh, an extensive piece of work between uh, May and November last year. 14 vice chancellors steered the project. We touched well over a thousand HE colleagues um, and we looked at the impact of the pandemic, how universities were planning in the UK for the current academic year. More importantly, we cast our eyes to 2030 and we uh, left the sector with seven challenges really in the context of preparing for the current academic year. Embedding digital at the heart of university culture, looking uh, short for your investment, but thinking long. Embracing blended in curriculum redesign because the conclusion of the report that was that the future was indeed blended. There was an, uh, a recognition that the digital skills and confidence importantly of students and staff needed development. Communication was key in terms of benefits. And of course, there's the thorny issue of digital poverty uh, in all its forms. This was complementary to work that was underway at the Office for Students, um, led by Sir Michael Barber, the then chair of the Office for Students uh, at, at the time. And they issued their Gravity Assist report in, in February. And the six kind of um, recommendations, actions that the OFS outlined were very, very uh, complementary to those expressed in learning, teaching, reimagined, working closely with students to inform them what digital skills they would need, involving students in curriculum design, moving towards that co-creation that I'm sure has been explored in other places, equipping staff with the correct skills, making the environment safe, etc. So the the push is clearly around embracing digital, moving along that physical to digital continuum. We did a survey as part of the project and we had over 20,000 student responses. And I thought, Phil, colleagues, it would be useful just to share what we were being told. So a lot of this is obvious, but it, it is worth reinforcing. So look, online lectures, not the same as on campus. It's difficult to stay engaged looking at the screen for eight hours a day. We see that, I'm sure, as we engage in symposia, conferences, meetings. It's hard. We need guidance to help us engage with online learning to remain focused. Trying to teach large groups, the 200 is the example here, is not effective. It's not effective in sort of real life, never mind in the virtual world. So can we look at bubble groups to teach online? Can we teach in, in smaller uh, ways um, that, that are more interactive? And can we create support networks and create more of that social experience that characterizes a huge element actually of the overall student experience. There were lots of positive things. The recordings make a big difference, help us to understand, you know, we can vary the pace we watch, we can slow things down, speed things up, we can pause, go back, think, reflect, read around, uh, helps us improve the quality of our note taking, our understanding uh, of what we're being um, told. It, la it lets us catch up if for any reason we miss a session. Uh, clearly there are advantages for those working uh, in other languages and very practically often the cavernous nature of much of the real estate in universities makes hearing difficult well online that's better. Other positive things we do prefer live sessions they're naturally more interactive and engaging um, some students like online better because of the flexibility and the convenience. 
particularly uh, students who are balancing their study with personal work, caring responsibilities. Um, therefore, there's a less rigid approach to the way in which they have to engage. With and from peers is important. Can we can we kind of look at more small group activities? They're better for us than larger groups. And just to say and to reinforce, and I know we've got an international audience, Phil, but the effort that went in that allowed the pivot to take place from the physical to the virtual world was extraordinary. And, and you know, all staff in universities deserve huge credit and commendation for that. And students in this survey were very much acknowledging that. More negatively, we can't get in. It's difficult to access lectures and the online resources. Sometimes the timeliness, the scheduling is not helpful to us. It's harder than you think, can feel overwhelming, feels like there's too much work that, you know, we've got to do more independently than previously. And perhaps we haven't got the advice, the support, the guidance to help us do that well. We struggle to concentrate and focus. As I've said, screen time is debilitating. Some of the inputs are, are too lengthy. There, there are insufficient breaks. Um, we get fatigued. We, we worry. We don't communicate well. We feel a bit isolated. We feel a bit lonely. I, I must stress, by the way, that this feedback was coming to us in the very early part of this calendar year, February. Things have developed lots of improvement since then. So what can we do? Well, we can get the basics right, get the Wi-Fi right. Um, we just have been working with the government, both behind the scenes and front of house, to try and extend edural networks in the UK into public places where local authorities have govroom. It won't mean much to some international listeners, I appreciate, but getting the ability for students to connect in coffee shops, in parks, in, in restaurants and so on it is an important thing. More interactivity, better use of recordings, more staff development, think about pace, create opportunities for, for questions uh, and so on and so forth and, and offer timely feedback. So to finish, I, I just thought, well, hearing all that, taking the outputs, and engaging every week, every day with UK universities, there's a lot to reflect on, a lot to do. And what will it indeed look like as we get to 2030? I, I chaired a podcast a few weeks ago with four vice chancellors. One of them said something very simple, but something very profound, which was, John, we used to think we knew our students. It turns out we're going to have to get to know them a whole lot better because student choice is going to characterise what we uh, have to respond to in this new order. Students will want blended and they'll want it at their convenience in a way that suits their lives. Four, four, five quick bullet points there. What's missing is a focus on the social elements of learning. Students have said to us, we miss lectures, which has puzzled us. We've, we've jumped into that and said, what do you mean? They don't mean they miss lectures per se, they mean they miss everything that goes on around the lecture. The, the, the mixing and mingling before you go in, the checking what the lecturer has said, what the assessment means, all that social informal learning that complements um, the, the sort of uh, formal class or laboratory activity. There's evidence, I think, that the gains that have been made uh, through the pandemic in terms of the use of the tools and the technology may be rolled back. That There's a sense that some universities, some faculties and schools are, are looking forward to going back to normal. I think if that normal doesn't take account of what students want, there are dangers lurking. That needs to be thought of very carefully. The leadership and management of the physical and digital is clearly altering. There was a sense through the Learning Teaching Reimagine project that and this is a, a number I, as I've not empirically tested, but people were saying to us for every pound that was spent on the digital campus, about 10 pounds was spent on the physical campus. That ratio has to change. And the investment and leadership of a digital strategy, digital leadership is clearly gonna have to take uh, center stage. Also, 
the way we design curricula needs careful thought. Designing digital delivery that demands high-end devices and high bandwidth connectivity is not going to help solve the digital poverty challenge. So canniness and cleverness in curriculum design is going to need uh, careful thought. And, and finally, uh, Phil colleagues, there's a narrative out there, isn't there, when you pick up the, the British press that says, you know, online, bad, not value, in-person, good, probably okay. That's got to change. And, you know, we're, we're in, a, in an era of perceived high tuition, um, persuading stakeholders that online blended learning is as valuable, as stretching, as demanding as the physical on campus version uh, is, is going to be a, a difficult ask. That's the end, Phil. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, thank you very much. That was, uh, that was a great presentation. Um, we, we do have a question in the chat. Um, it's from uh, Dr. Louise Naylor. Louise, would you like to unmute yourself? Yes, certainly, Phil. Um, yes, the question was really about um, some of the challenges we've had recognising that we will still have remote learners. And I wonder whether uh, you would talk a little bit about the hybrid or high flex learning, high flex where learners can actually choose their route through. Do you want to just give some of your views about that? Because I know this is something that lots of universities are struggling with at the moment. Our students are not all in one place. And yet we're trying to get an equivalent student learning experience. Thanks, Jonathan. I think it's a great question, Louise, and I think it's really hard. Um, it, it, you know, um, the, the, the people in JISC who are working day to day on this, their simple, but in parenthesis, not very helpful advice is don't do it. But of course, that's not really an option in this rather messy period that, that we're in just now. There was some research came out of CNI, which is the um, in, in North America. Uh, I, I don't know what the acronym stands for, but it's the organization that deals with learning um, librarians, learning technologists, etc. in um, Ivy League institutions. And their firm recommendation was not to do it either because nobody gets the best experience. The people who are coming in on devices, you know, struggle to hear, struggle to raise points. Um, academics, naturally, leaders forget they're there and don't bring them in. At the same time, when they do try to bring them in, it creates a stilted environment for those who are physically present. And everybody leaves slightly dissatisfied, including the, the academics concerned. So we are doing a, a, a bit more work on it. Louise, um, to try and, you know, get into the subtleties and nuances, recognising this is something that needs to be concluded swiftly if it's to have any value. And maybe it's the subject of a of another session, uh, either at one of Phil's events or, or somewhere else. But it's a cracking question. I wish I had a better answer for you.